Hi, this is Dr. Bob Teal of the Continuing Church of God. Could Petra, a place that's currently located in the nation of Jordan, be the place of safety that the Bible talks about? Well, today I want to talk about this, uh, this place of safety to go over what uh, Jesus said, look to the Bible, and see what we can learn th from the Bible about who may go, who's probably not going, and why a place such as uh, Petra and Jordan might be the possible place. If you take your Bibles, if you go to the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 3, uh, the disciples came up to Jesus and said, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And in verse 4, Jesus starts to say, Okay, take heed, you don't get deceived, and he goes through a variety of steps. But if you go over to verse 20 through uh, 21, it said, And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For verse 21, then there shall be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. So what we're seeing here from Jesus is that the great tribulation begins after some people are uh, fleeing. Now years ago, in a publication called The Journal, The News of the Church is God, like a decade or so ago, they used to have a lot of articles where people said there's no place of safety or Petra's not the place of safety. But they also had at least one odd idea. And this, I'll read this. Mr. Blank sees relevance in Joshua 15, where Joshua signs the tribe of Judah its boundaries. This passage talks about a salt sea, verse 2, which could bring in mind Utah's great salt sea. If you take away the J from the word Judah and change the D to a T, you have Utah, he pointed out. Also in verse 55 is named Utah, which is the same as Utah if one simply deletes one of the J, the, the J at the beginning and one of the T's. Now that's kind of odd logic, but that's the logic that somebody had on the location of the place of safety. The well, purpose of this sermon is to explain again more about this place and why a location such as Petra in Jordan is a logical place for Christians who believe the Bible to consider could be the place that God has in mind. Now I want to be perfectly clear. The Bible says there are two groups. Now, uh, one who goes to a place and one that does not go to a place. And a lot of uh, people outside the Church of God are confused about that. They think basically that some of them do, that all people who profess Christ are going to be raptured away or something to this effect and there's, there's no church or there's nothing else going on during the time of the Great Tribulation that way but the others will be called later. That's not actually what your Bible says. If you turn, take your Bible and you turn to the book of Revelation chapter 12 and you start over here in verse 14. It says, But the woman, now this woman is the church, was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place. The wilderness, it's not heaven, it's the wilderness where she is nourished for a time, time, and half a times from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed out water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Verse 16. But the earth helped the woman. Again, another proof that this is not heaven because the, this is the earth is helping the woman. And swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Now verse 17 is the part I want to focus on because it talks about two groups here. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, with the church, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So there's a couple of things in here that, to emphasize. First of all, these are Christians that are not going. There are some Christians who are going to go and there are some Christians who are not going to go. And the ones who uh, do not go have the testimony of Jesus Christ and they keep the commandments of God. So just because uh, you may consider yourself a Christian, uh, whether you're a, 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 a Church of God Christian or some, somebody else of some other persuasion who thinks you may be a Christian, the reality is just because you profess Christ and presuming you also keep the commandments of God, that is not a guarantee that you're going to receive protection in this place in the wilderness. Because again, there were two groups that were mentioned in Revelation 12, 17. One group that gets protected and one group that does not. Now Jesus uh, warned 
about what may happen toward the time of the end. If you go to the book of Luke, chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, and starting in verse 34 through 36, Jesus said, But take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that that day come upon you unexpectedly. Oh, so it's possible, and he's talking to people, by the way, who read the Bible, that you would presume, that the day could come upon them unexpectedly. In verse 35, Jesus says, you know, it's going to come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. Verse 36, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus said to pray to become worthy to escape. So just knowing that there's some type of an escape, and just knowing that there's a place in the wilderness is not enough. You're also supposed to pray that you be counted worthy to escape all these things so you can stand before the Son of Man. Now, those of us in the continuing Church of God, and many who have a, a Church of God background, believe in a concept known as church eras. And that basically means that the letters to the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 talk about not only specific churches, and not only conditions that exist throughout the true church throughout history, but also that they represent somewhat of a chronology of history of the church. And that essentially the first era of the church was the Ephesus era, followed by Smyrna, uh, Pergamos, uh, Thyatira, uh, Sardis, uh, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, in that order. Well, Jesus had different messages for each of these churches. So if you take your Bible and you go to the book of Revelation, chapter uh, 3, and I'm going to start in verse 7. It says, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, and we'll skip down here to verse uh, 10, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Verse 11, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no, no one may take your crown. Sadly, a lot of people who believed in church eras, uh, believed in the 18 truths that Herbert Armstrong said God used him to restore to the Philadelphia or the church, and who held fast to other beliefs, haven't been holding fast to them anymore. So this is a warning to the church that some people will fall for other arguments, some people will decide that certain things don't matter as much, uh, some people will not be holding fast to what a Philadelphia Christian should hold fast to. And because of that, they are at risk. But notice though, in verse 10, that Jesus said to the Philadelphians, that because they kept his command to persevere, he would keep them from that hour of trial. Now you can read the messages to the other churches. He doesn't say that to them. So that tells us that there's a distinction between those Christians that Jesus considers to be Philadelphian and the other Christians, because the other Christians do not get the same promise of protection in the book of Revelation. Now there's a difference between some of the groups. I'm going to focus on one or two. If you go to chapter 3 again, in verse 8, this again, this is to the Philadelphians, Jesus says, I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door. And this is an open door to proclaim the gospel. And, and no one will, can shut it. For you have, kept, have a little strength, you've kept my word, and you've not denied my name. So Jesus is telling the Philadelphia Christians, look, you're doing the work. You're holding fast to true doctrine. You're not just proclaiming something so you can tell people you've proclaimed it. But he also says something interesting or similar, verse 14, to the angel of the, the, of the uh, church of the Laodiceans. I'm going to skip to this, verse 15. I know your works. So it starts out kind of the same. That you are not cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. So Jesus is contrasting the work of the Philadelphians to the work of the Laodiceans. The Laodiceans have a different type of work. They don't feel they need 
uh, what they need. They don't see their spiritual wretchedness. They don't think they have to have the proper type of work to go through the open, open doors and whatever other criteria that Jesus has. So there's a difference between two groups of Christians in the New Testament and what's going to happen to them. Jesus does not like the works of one group and he does like the works of the other group. Now, interestingly, Philadelphia and Laodicea are, well, they're both made up of Greek words, and those words have meanings. Now, according to uh, Strong's uh, Greek concordance, Philadelphia means fraternal affection, brotherly love, love of the brethren, or fond of the brethren. And I believe that Philadelphians show this by not only loving the truth, but sacrificing in order to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom to the world as a witness. More so, and in more sincerity, than the Laodiceans who sometimes do something like that. Now according to Strong's, Laodicea is made up of two words, Laos or Laos, which means people, and Daike, which is defined by Strong as right, judgment, punish, or vengeance. Smith's Bible Dictionary defines Laodicea to mean justice of the people. Now might the term Laodicean convey that the predominant characteristics of this church is that the people judge, or in fact that they're judgmental? I personally feel that the term Laodicea conveys a misunderstanding of governance, uh, that they have rejected either the uh, restored truth about hierarchical governments, governance, or they look to men and not leaders that God appoints. I also believe that the Laodiceans are lukewarm toward their own sins. Now, of course, we all have sins and we all need to repent, but they don't recognize a lot of their sins and the problems they have within their midst. Now, what happens to people who do not go to a place of protection? You can turn there if you'd like, and this is going to be the book of Lamentations, chapter 4. I'm going to go through this just briefly. Uh, Lamentations, which I should find here, it's after uh, uh, Jeremiah. Uh, 4, uh, verses 4 through 19, it's quite a bit in here. But it says, the tongue of the infant clings to the roof of the mouth of for thirst, the young children ask for bread, but no one breaks it for them. Verse 5, those who ate delicacies are desolate in the street. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I think this is partially referring to the Anglo-descended peoples, because they were wealthy. Those who were brought up in scarlet and braised ash heaps. Verse 6, the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment. So we see that this is a period that lasts a long time. This is not like the immediate destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, verse 8, their appearance is blacker than soot. They go unrecognized in the streets. Their skin clings to their bones. It's become dry as wood. Verse 9, those slain by the sword are better off than those who die of hunger, those who pine away, stricken for the lack of the fruits of the field. Verse 10, the hands of the compassionate woman have cooked their children. They become food for them in the destruction of the daughter of my people. Verse 11, the eternal has fulfilled his fury. He has poured out his fierce anger. He has kindled a fire in uh, Zion and devoured its foundations. And the kings of the earth and the abbots will say, would not have believed that the adversary, the enemy, could enter the gates of Jerusalem. Now this could be figuratively Jerusalem or literally Jerusalem. If it's figuratively, figuratively Jerusalem, this would make a lot of biblical sense in terms of the modern sign because if the United States somewhat represents uh, Jerusalem, no one really thinks that an enemy can come and destroy the United States. But this can uh, combine with other scriptures in the Bible, such as uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 39, it says the king of the north is going to take over those of the strongest fortresses, which right now would be the United States, suggests a terrible destruction coming to the United States and its Anglo-descended neighbors, or the allies. Uh, and this again, this is going through the book of Lamentations. Uh, verse 13, because of the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of their priests who shed blood in the midst of her, the blood of the just. Well, a lot of false prophets in the United States and some of the Anglo lands say, oh, Christians, you don't have to worry about any of this. You're just going to be raptured up. Uh, 
but they're going to get people to believe things that are not true. There are other false prophets who say that the United States is about to enter a, an age of peace. Some of them claim to be Christian, and others are more on the New Age side. Verse 16, the face of the eternal scattered them. He no longer regards them. By the way, when the king of the north invades uh, strongest fortress, he's going to scatter the people. Uh, the priests do not respect the people do not respect the priests nor show favor to the elders. Verse 17. Still our eyes have failed us, watching vainly for our help. For in watching we watched for a nation that could not save us. So people will hope that someone's going to stand up, allies will protect them, but it's just not going to happen. Verse 8, excuse me, verse 19. Our pursuers were swifter than the eagles of heavens. They pursued us on the mountains and lay in wait for us in the wilderness. This is the kind of period of time that Jesus is talking about. A time that's supposed to be worse than any other time. It is not going to be fun. It's not going to be nice to not be in a place of protection. This is a place that physically and spiritually Christians should want to go to. You should not want to go through the Great Tribulation. You should take, you should pray fast, meditate, study your Bible, do what you need to do so you do not have to be one who is not counted worthy to escape all these things as Jesus talked about. Uh, let's go over to uh, uh, the book of uh, Matthew again. We're going to go back to Matthew 24 and we're going to see again it says, For there shall be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time no shall ever be. So that period of time I was reading in the book of Lamentations, um, it's going to be no better than that time because this says it's the worst time there was. Verse 22, Unless those days were shortened, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. So if this period continued indefinitely, people would not be saved. But for the elect's sake, which is mostly talking about the Christians who will be in a, a place of protection or a place of safety. Those days will be shortened. Now, similarly, if you go over to the, back to the book of Jeremiah, I know we didn't go quite all the way far back. We went to uh, his writings when we read uh, Lamentations. Chapter 30, verse 7, we read, Alas, for that day is great, so none is like it. It's the time of Jacob's trouble that he will be saved from it. Which means eventually Jesus will return and stop all these things from, from happening. But it is going to be a time of physical terror. Now, just prior to the Great Tribulation, something is going to happen. So if you'll take your Bibles and turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 12. We're going to read something from Daniel, chapter 12. And it says, at that time, this is just before the Great Tribulation, shall Michael, the archangel, shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation, even to that time. So just before that happens, Michael, the archangel, is going to stand up. Now, this expression, at that time, is the same expression in the Hebrew that is in Daniel chapter 11, verse 35. And it says there, And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them and purify them and make them white until the time of the end, because it's still the appointed time. This is the time that Michael will stand up. Now, why does he stand up? I believe that Michael the archangel stands up then because this is the time to help protect those who will be fleeing to a place of safety. Now the question is, are most people going to go to this place who are Christian or not? Well, three places in the New King James Version of the Bible, it uses the expression time, times, and half a times. There are Revelation 12.14, uh, which I read before, uh, Daniel uh, 7.25, and Daniel 12.7. Right now I'd like to go to Daniel 7.24 uh, and 25, because that's going to give us a couple of ideas or some clues about what's going to be happening. It says in Daniel 7, verse 24, And the ten horns are ten kings, who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He'll be different from the first ones. He'll subdue three kings. So this is a different kind of a king. Verse 25, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, 
and shall intend to change times of law. Okay? He does this, and then, that means afterwards, after he starts to persecute the saints. So he may be persecuting the Philadelphians, the non-Philadelphians, whatever saints he can get. Then the saint shall be given to his hand for a time, times, and half a times. What do you mean the saints are going to be given to his hands? Wait a second, he's already persecuted some of them. Now they're, then they're going to be given to his hands? All of them? No, we know it's not all, because Jesus promised to protect the Philadelphians. He promised in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, because they kept Jesus' command to persevere. He would keep them from the hour of trial that's coming around the, the whole world. But you'll see that the, the fact that the saints are given into his, the hand of this beast power, that this beast power, that shows that most people, most people who are actual Christians, not just people who claim to be Christian, not people who were baptized and were babies who don't really practice Christianity, not that, but people who are actually Christian, most will not be protected, but instead will be given into the hands of the beast power. Now, why would God allow much of the church to experience any or some tribulation? Well, we read it before, but in Daniel chapter 11, verse 35, gives us a clue. Because it says, And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, make them white until the time of the end, because it's still for the appointed time. So while this is referring to some Christians who will be persecuted prior to the Great Tribulation, it's also talking about some Christians that will be persecuted during the time of the Great Tribulation. Now, let's go over to Daniel chapter 12, just right over the page here, starting in verse 9. And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed and sealed until the time of the end. Verse 10, Many shall be purified and made white and refined. Aha! So up until this time of the end, during the tribulation, this is what's going to happen. But the, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise will understand. So we see again, there's a time that those who profess Christ, or who are actual Christians, are going to be subject to, to persecution. Now, interestingly, if you go back to Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, it says, Then I heard a man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, and he held up his right hand and his right hand and his left hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, time, and half a time, same period as I've been talking about, when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered and all these things finished. The power of the holy people being completely shattered, well, the two witnesses will be around and there will be uh, Christians in different spots. But the shattering seems to be that this is the end of the organized, some of the more organized time for the church, and because this will be during the time of the Great Tribulation and the Day of the Lord, which will last at uh, three and a half years or time, time, and half a times. Now, interestingly, there's a passage in the book of Ezekiel. So if you can take your Bibles, go to Ezekiel chapter 5. And we're going to read here uh, in verses 3 and 4. You shall also take a small number of them, that's hair, and bind them in the edge of your garment, then take some of them again and throw some in the midst of the fire and burn them with the fire. From a fire... From there, fire shall go out in all the house of Israel. Verse 5. This is Jerusalem, and I set her in the midst of the nations, and the countries all around her. So some believe that these first few small number of hairs in verse 3 could be God telling Ezekiel that some Christians will be protected from this fiery time of trial that's going to affect the earth. Now, I wanted to explain in this sermon where the place of safety is, but possibly it might be best to start off to see where the Bible says it's not. If you've got your Bibles, let's go over to the book of uh, Jeremiah. And this time we're going to start in chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. Starting in verse 5. Declare in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say, Blow the trumpet in the land, cry, Gather together, and say, Assemble yourselves, and let us go to the fortified cities, set up the standard toward Zion, take refuge, do not delay. 
for I will bring disaster from the north and great destruction. Okay, so we're starting to hear telling the people who are in Jerusalem and Judea that destruction and disaster is going to come from the north. So there's a pretty good hint or clue that this place of protection is not in the north of Jerusalem or Judea. Now, interestingly, Jesus also made sort of a similar comment. If you take your Bibles, this time we'll go to the New Testament, to the book of Luke. Luke chapter uh, uh, 21. And starting in verse 20, it says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let, her, let not those who are in the country enter her. In other words, those in the countryside shouldn't go into Jerusalem, and people who are in Jerusalem should depart. So we find out, again, you don't want to be in Jerusalem. That is not the place of protection. It's not the place of safety, according to Jesus. Now, the Bible also warns that God's people should flee Babylon and, and uh, not be in the land of Chaldea. And I'm not going to read those, but that would be Jeremiah 50, verse 8, Jeremiah 51, 6, uh, 44 through 45, Zechariah uh, 2, 7, and Revelation 18, 4. But also notice from the book of Zechariah, we're going to go to the book of Zechariah, chapter 2, Zechariah 2. Verse 7, Up Zion, escape you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. So this to me is a warning to Christians who may be in territories that the, the, the Babylonian Empire, the final one, the one that Jesus warns about, which again in this, this verse is called the uh, uh, daughter of Babylon. That there will be Christians within the territory and that they need to leave. I suspect, by the way, that because of this, because of the fact that a, an ecumenical religion will have entered Europe, which will probably call itself Catholic, but it will be a modified form of Catholicism, some vigilantes types might rise up and, and though, again, there will be some persecution of Christians. We may see some people decide to flee and go down to Jerusalem or Judea, some Christians there, before the Great Tribulation begins because, because they may decide it's a convenient place to stay. Uh, we, we know from Jesus' words that there are probably going to be Christians who are going to have to flee from uh, Jerusalem or Judea. And it may be that part of the Shalees are going to be fulfilling this passage in Zechariah uh, 2.7 that they have to escape those who dwell with the, the, uh, the daughter of Babylon. Now it's possible also that we may see some people in some of the African countries and perhaps Latin American countries and other places who also start to have some persecution and they decide to head over toward the Middle East to Israel uh, before the time to go to a place of protection. Now, because the Bible prophesies destruction of islands. You can read in uh, Revelation 6, 12 through 14, and 16, 17 through 21. No island itself appears to be the likely place or place of safety. So because of that, I've pretty much eliminated that. Now, here's some more information about the place. And this time, we're going to go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 45. Book of Isaiah, chapter 45. Um, actually, let's first go to uh, Isaiah 33. We'll do that first. And we're going to start in verse 15 and 16. It says, He who. Now, these are some ideas about who's going to go to the place. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed, and is not bloodthirsty or wants to watch violence, and shuts his eyes from seeing evil, 
Verse 16, he will dwell on high. His place defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him and his water will be sure. So we see some protection is promised for those who do what God wants and they will be provided uh, 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 bread and water. So Isaiah is indicating this may be a fortress of rocks. Now, in Isaiah 45, there's another concept that I'd like to mention in verse 20. It says, Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together. You who have escaped from the nations. Okay, so there are people who are going to escape and they need to assemble together. Okay? So again, some of them may have assembled in uh, Jerusalem or Judea uh, and others may be actually assembling perhaps in, in Jordan. Now, this idea of gathering together is very interesting. Now, while the book of Isaiah suggests that the gathering will happen later, if you go to the book of Zephaniah, one of the so-called minor prophets, the book of Zephaniah, uh, chapter 2, we read, Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O undesirable nation. Christians are considered a peculiar people, the book of uh, Peter referred to them as, so, and the world's going to consider that uh, we're an odd people. And when you're supposed to gather together, before the decree is issued, or the day passes like the chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Verse 3, Seek the eternal, all you meek of the earth, you who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Why? It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the eternal's anger. But what's interesting also about this, you're supposed to gather together. And when you're supposed to do it, listen to this, before the decree is issued, what decree? The decree to go to a place of protection, a place of safety. As I said, I believe that some in probably some of the European nations, perhaps some of the Latin American nations, perhaps some of the African nations, and perhaps elsewhere, will decide before a decree is issued that they need to leave their lands to, to minimize or reduce the persecution that's happening on them. But a decree is going to be issued. So people who think that they can wait until the last minute to support the work of the Church of God and that, that, that they're going to know it intuitively or they just are so close to God that, that they'll just figure this out are possibly deceiving themselves. Because the Bible says in Zephaniah 2.1 to gather yourselves together before, verse 2, the decree is issued. So those who are going to be protected should be gathering together now, supporting the work, getting this work done, so it may be that they will be protected. Interestingly, by the way, the word, of, uh, word Zephaniah means Yahweh hides. And so I think that's very interesting. And as far as this decree being issued, I believe at this moment that this decree would be issued by uh, someone in the continuing Church of God. Uh, uh, maybe somebody currently in it, and maybe somebody in the future. But that's where I believe the decree will come from. Now, let's also look in Zephaniah. So we get a few clues. Notice this. Zephaniah 2, verse 4. This again, this is talking about after we're talking about being hidden, it says, verse 4, For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon desolate. They shall drive out Ashdod at noonday, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to the inhabitants of the sea coast, the nation of the Chetarites, the word of the Eternals against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I will destroy you, so there shall be no inhabitant. Okay, so now what we're starting to see, now what we're starting to see is that there's places that you're not supposed to go. Now I'm going to open this uh, older Bible that I have to a map that hopefully will help people get a better idea as to uh, geographic locations over there. Now you'll see that we've got Jerusalem by this finger here. All right. Now if you go slightly to the, uh, the south and the east, Further down, you're going to see the lands of the Philistines. That's uh, uh, Canaan, uh, uh, Ashkelon, Gaza, those kind of places. Those are places right now that are basically inhabited by the Palestinians. And those are, according to this scripture in Zephaniah, probably not the place to go since they're going to have problems. Well, you can't go west 
or much west of Jerusalem for two reasons. One, the Bible warned not to be part of the sea coast. But furthermore, the Mediterranean Sea is there. You can't go any further. Now notice where my lower finger is here. Selah. Now that is another word for the term Petra. Now you'll notice that compared to Jerusalem, it is south of Jerusalem. It's south, south, southwest. So basically it's, uh, uh, excuse me, west. I meant uh, to say east. It is slightly to the east, but very south of Jerusalem. And so we read before, you're not supposed to go to the north. We read you're not supposed to go to the sea coast. We read you're not supposed to go to the uh, Palestinian regions. So that basically leaves the south or the east. Now that doesn't prove that Petra is the location, but it does allow for the fact that it's a possible location. Now interestingly, in the book of Psalms, David wrote something that I'd like to read. If you take your Bible, you go to the book of Psalm, chapter 27, in verse 5, you'll see David wrote, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Now this might have dual meaning. It might be interesting, to, to, it might be referring to tribulation, and it also might be referring to an interesting event that happened in David's life. When David was hiding in the woods from Saul in 1 Samuel uh, 23, 19, um, something happened. So let's go to 1 Samuel uh, 23, and I'm going to read that here. Samuel 23 and read a couple of passages here verse 25 it says when Saul and his men went to seek him they told David therefore somebody told David therefore he David went down to the rock and then uh, in verse uh, uh, 26, it says that David, David made haste to get away from Saul. And then in verse 27, therefore Saul returned from pursuing David, and he went against the Philistines. So they called the place the Rock of Escape, or the Selah of Escape. Remember I just showed uh, you a, a, a map, this, this, so Selah and Petra. So this may have a do uh, another another meaning for us in Psalm 27 about God protecting his people on a rock. And by the way, uh, Petra, it means rock by the way, and Selah is a rocky place. It's a place with lots of, lots of rock. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, Petra is a rocky outpost uh, in Jordan. It's out in the wilderness. Various ones have speculated it could be the place. Uh, let me read you uh, something from uh, Stanford's uh, website about Petra. Look, situated within the harsh desert, Petra's vitality was dependent on an intricate hydraulic system fed by a perennial spring. This spring, the Ain Musa, or the Spring of Moses, is fabled to have been one of the places where Moses struck the rock with his staff to produce water for his wandering people after their flight from Egypt. Not surprisingly, the valley which Petra is located the Wadi Musa, Valley of Moses, is also named after the biblical patriarch. In addition, Moses' brother Aaron is believed to have been buried on top of Jebel Haron, the Mount of Aaron, a mountain just south of the city. The belief that Aaron was buried so near Petra is especially noteworthy because it played an important role in Petra's rediscovery. That's one of the reasons they found it. But as I mentioned, though, what's very interesting about Petra, it's basically south uh, and slightly east of uh, Jerusalem, so it is a location that is consistent with the scripture. Now, I should mention that some have alleged the idea that uh, the place of safety uh, existing and being a place like Petra was some, something that uh, either Herbert Armstrong or his wife Loma came up with uh, decades ago in order to scare people or to uh, get converts or whatever. Well, this is just simply not the case. Um, the idea that there's a place of protection 
has been in uh, church literature for a long time. As a matter of fact, uh, those who may be of the Catholic persuasion uh, might find, be surprised to find that people such as Irenaeus and Hippolytus, uh, both second and third century uh, uh, Catholic, basically Catholic theological writers, uh, wrote about this. And this has also been confirmed by even more recent Catholic writings. I'd like to read something from 1956. Uh, this is talking about Book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 14. So she is given two wings of a great eagle. This intimates rescue by airplane. The great eagle may send or have an airplane to bring its citizens home. God promises those who will take shall take his wings as eagles. The wings of the great eagle will enable the woman to fly to the wilderness. This wilderness is a heathen nation. The great eagle, therefore, is a nation. Uh, is not Christian, or they said Catholic. The word eagle suggests this nation may uh, become great by conquest. This eagle shall protect and shelter the church during the reign of the beast, the place of safety for the woman. Aha, so the Catholics clearly talk about a place of safety for the woman in Revelation chapter uh, 12. And that's important because some modern Catholics have now said that the woman has got to do with Mary or something as opposed to the church. But again, this idea of a place of safety, being in the wilderness, is not just some recent invention of, of the Armstrongs. Now even the Rheims New Testament, which is the Catholic ex standard, if you will, it's kind of like the, the King James Version is to Protestants, the Rheims New Testament is to some Catholics, teach that there's a place in the desert for the true church to flee. Let me read it. The church shall flee as to a desert in Antichrist's time, but not decay or be unknown, no, not for a short time. So that's kind of interesting, yet again, the idea that there's a place of protection was known. Yet, uh, Satan has affected, or his demons have affected certain Catholic mystics who are actually, who actually made prophecies a long time ago to warn about people who might go to a place of safety. I believe Satan inspired these prophecies to warn uh, Catholics and others who are uh, deceived by the beast and the false prophet at the end to not pay attention or not trust the Christians that are going to be in this place of safety. Let me read something from a mystic named Anne Catholic Emmerich from October of 1820, so nearly 200 years ago. I saw the secret society undermining the great church and near them a horrible beast concealing itself in a cave. Now I've not been to Petra but uh, it's a place full of caves and by the way there's other places in Jordan near it that have a lot of caves. But I find it interesting uh, and Catherine Emmerich other places refers to this group as the secret sect, in this case the secret society, undermining the great church. What great church? The ecumenical church that will be prevalent at the time of the end. So this is a warning that this is, this is not good. Now furthermore, there was a Catholic mystic called uh, Hildegard of Sweden, who's also a Catholic saint, and in the 12th century, so quite a long time ago, over 800 years ago, she wrote, and fly from those who linger in caves and are cloistered supporters of the devil. So she's basically warning that there will be Christians who are hiding in caves, but she says they're really serving the devil. Woe to them, woe to them who remain thus. They are the devil's very viscera, or guts, and they are the advanced guard of the son of perdition. For those of you not particularly familiar with Catholic prophecy, uh, that what she's basically saying here is that before the Antichrist comes, in her view, that uh, there are going to be people who are hiding in a cave, but the fact they're hiding in a cave shows the Antichrist is about to come. Well, why is that relevant? Because many other Catholic prophecies from these mystics say the one that we call Jesus, who's going to return, they say he's the Antichrist. They have prophecies, for example, that say the Antichrist is going to go to church on Saturday. Well, Christians go to church on Saturday. It says the Antichrist is going to get rid of idols. I think Jesus would get rid of idols. The Antichrist will get rid of the, this modified Catholic Mass that they have. I think Jesus would do that. They also say that the Antichrist wins the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, well, while the battle is not actually held there, our Bible actually says Jesus wins that particular battle, or the, the battle associated with that time frame. So she's warning that because you see people hiding in caves, 
that the Antichrist is about to appear, where we in the Church of God would say, hold on, no, no. These people are hiding because the center perdition is already out there, and that we're waiting for Jesus to return. Now, she goes further to telling uh, people who are going to fall for this Catholic warning. Therefore, O you, my beloved children, avoid them with all devotion, with all the strength of your souls and bodies. For the ancient serpent feeds and clothes them by his arts. Oh, okay. So she even knows that passage I read, that uh, bread will be provided as water will be sure. Because God is going to make sure that his people are protected in this, and fed in water, get water in the place of protection, of safety. So is she saying that, uh, no, this has happened by false deceptions. Don't fall for this. Because they are afraid of my people, they do not openly resist these institutions of mine, but in their hearts, th their deeds hold them as nothing. By devilish illusion, they pretend to have sanct sanctity. In other words, she's saying these people, because they've been conned by Satan, they look good. Because people are going to look at real Christians, real Church of God Christians, and of course they're going to hopefully look uh, like they have some type of Christian sanctity. But she says they're deceived by the devil. And she says if, they were, if the devil was explained to them, they would understand. But he deludes them. Oh, woe to those who persevere in this death. So she's say, saying, don't join these people in the place of protection. Woe to you because it's not good. But that's not what the Bible says. Then she says, because the devil knows he's only a short time for his error, he's not hastening to perfect infidelity in his members. You deceivers, you who labor to subvert the Catholic faith. Well, people in the place of safety are going to be Church of God Christians. They're going to be supporting the message and the truth of the Bible that we have in the Church of God. And therefore, they will be against this ecumenical religion that's going to call itself the Catholic faith. I just find it interesting that Satan had this recorded back in the 1100s, the 12th century. And I believe that it will be cited by followers of the ecumenical faith as to why they shouldn't pay attention to the real Christians who will be being protected in a place of protection, which apparently has caves. Now, if you go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 56, I kind of wonder if some are going to ignore Hildegard's warnings. Now this is speculation on my part, but I think it's got a biblical basis. And we see here Isaiah chapter 56, verse 8. The, the Lord Eternal who gathers the outcasts of Israel says, Yet I will gather to him others beside those who are gathered to him. So I suspect that during the time of protection, in the place of protection, that some will actually come and join the Philadelphia Christians. On the other hand, I suspect that some who fled with the Philadelphia Christians will either betray them or depart or, or not be faithful during that time. Uh, because I, just like some people, when they left the children of Israel, did not really believe God, actually most of them, uh, we may see that some will uh, temporarily perhaps go to the place of safety who will not uh, remain protected because they're insincere or unconverted or, or whatever. Now, Catholic prophecy uh, is sort of interesting. There was a Catholic bishop in the uh, late second century named Victorinus that wrote, quote, but the woman fled into the wilderness and there were given her two great wings eagle's wings to, the, to that church to let them go to the place so they have ready to be prepared not to be supported there for three and a half years from excuse, three years and six months in the presence of the devil so the idea within other Catholic writings is yes there is a place of protection and God is going to do it again I quote these particular Catholic writings to tell you that the idea that there's a face of physical protection is not some new idea that someone just invented. Here's another one. This is from Cyril, Cyril of Jerusalem. He's considered a saint by the Catholics and the Ortho, Eastern Orthodox. In the fourth century he wrote, Antichrist shall reign for three and a half years only. We speak not from apocryphal books or the 
ones that don't count, but from Daniel, for he says, and they shall be given in his hand for a time, time, and half a times. A time is one year, which is coming shall for a while have increased. A time is the remaining two years of iniquity, making up some of three years, and a half a time is six months. Again, in another place, Daniel says the same thing. He swore by him that lives forever that it should be for time, time, and half a times. And some peradventure have re referred to what follows this, namely 1,290 days. Blessed he endures and comes to the uh, 1,335 days. For this cause we must hide ourselves and flee. So the idea then that there is a place of protection has been one that's been in... Uh, 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 been known for a long time. It's it's not a, it's not a new concept. Now even Protestant scholars have some concept of some of this, but they've got a problem with this because they don't tend to believe that saints can possibly go to church on Saturday. So they've got ways around this, and they tend to think that it's Jewish people. Now though the late Protestant scholar uh, Dr. Wolverd mentioned. Matthew 24, 15 through 22. Some believe that there will be a place in the desert that Israel can flee. Why did he say Israel? For two reasons. One, because Jesus said, pray that your flight not be in the Sabbath and the winter in Matthew 24. But also in Revelation 12, 17, or uh, 14 through 17, where it talks about people who have the testimony of Jesus Christ but keep the commandments of God. And since a lot of Protestant scholars don't believe you have to keep the commandments of God. They tend to teach there's a new dispensation that after the rapture that some of them teach, the pre-tribulation rapture, which is uh, not a biblical concept, that there'll be a new dispensation and people have to, have to keep the law again, or at least the Jews do. Uh, now, one of the more recent books by the Left Behind series uh, said that... Uh, that mentions that some of the remaining believers or Jewish believers will be congregating in Petra at the end time. So again, this is not a concept that is totally uh, unique to the Church of God. The Protestants and Catholics understand parts of it. They don't understand all of it, but they do understand uh, some of their scholars understand parts of it. Now, uh, Tim LaHaye, who's well known for the Death Behind books, and uh, someone with the name Ed Hinson wrote, Quote, the last half of the tribulation. Many commentators suggest Jews will flee to the ancient mountain fortress of Petra, which is in the wilderness of Jordan. Satan's final war, war will fall upon believing Jews, the rest of her children, who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12, 17. So right there you see, you got Protestant scholars say, oh, this has got to be Jews because they have the testimony of Jesus Christ and they keep the commandments. No, these are people in the church of God. These are the saints, as it says in Revelation 14, 12. The patience of the saints. The saints are the ones who have the testimony of Jesus Christ and keep the commandments of God. Uh, in the book of uh, 1 John, he, uh, 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 the Apostle John was inspired to write, He who says he knows me but keeps not my commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. And these, a lot of these Protestant scholars don't believe you have to keep the commandments and therefore, uh, they need to take a closer look at themselves because it's the Church of God, real Christians, that the Bible talks about protecting. Now, although he was uh, somewhat discussing the idea of the millennium, uh, the Catholic saint, and who, a person I actually consider fairly significant heretic, but he had some interesting words that he wrote. A guy by the name of Irenaeus in the uh, late second century wrote, Now the promises, that the promises were not announced to the prophets and fathers alone, but to the churches united to these from the nations, whom also the Spirit terms the islands. And he's endorsing the concept in here with what he wrote. He says, both, because both they are established in the midst of the turbulence, suffer the storm of blasphemies, exist as a harbor of safety to those in peril, and are the refuge of those who love the height of heaven. And what he's trying to say here, in plain English, is that he believes that in the Old Testament there are a bunch of prophecies that are applicable to Christians, that there will be a place of protection that they will be protected in. Now, he may have gotten this, by the way, from true Christians. Irenaeus claimed, for example, to have known uh, the Saint Polycarp. Polycarp was uh, put in charge of the Church of God in Smyrna 
by the apostles such as John, and Irenaeus uh, ran into him. Now, although Irenaeus uh, had a lot of heresies, I think he did get some proper doctrine from the Church of God, and I think that's one of the reasons why he wrote about some of them. Now, interestingly, we have another time period. We've got the Middle Ages, and we have the time of the persecution known as uh, the Inquisition. And there was a Roman Catholic bishop, an inquisitor, by the name of uh, Bernard uh, Guidonis, and here's what he noted about some people he called heretics. Now bear with me because I'm going to re read this. Again, they say, that's the people that uh, they're persecuting, the inquisitors are persecuting. So these, so these may be Christians or people who knew real Christians. That both in the time of the persecution by Antichrist and that of the aforesaid war, carnal Christians would be of so afflicted, despairing, they will say, if Christ were God, he would not permit Christians to suffer so much an intense evil. Thus despairing, they will apostatize their faith and die. But So, some true Christians, back during the time of the Inquisition, said that there will be people who fall away from the Church of God. These are people who will be, we thought would be Christians, but they're going to say, no, it's too bad. These will be people who didn't go to the place of protection. Thus despairing, they will apostatize from the faith. But notice this. But God will hide the elect spiritual individuals so they cannot be found by Antichrist and his ministers. Then the church will be reduced to the small size as a primitive church when it was first founded. Aha! So we find within what appears to be testimony from Church of God people, again this is testimony that was recorded by an inquisitor, somebody who was persecuting them, that they, the people in the Church of God believed, or at least these people who were being persecuted believed, that in the time of the Antichrist, a lot of uh, so-called Christians would fall away, and that the very elect, in this case would be the Philadelphians, will actually be protected. So again, this is not a new concept, and it's been in the literature uh, quite a long time. Now, I'd like to read some of what Herbert Armstrong wrote about Petra to make his position clear. Petra, now this is from a 1956 letter, may very well be the site for God's protection of his people, those who will be counted worthy to escape the terrifying great tribulation that soon is strike unsuspecting Israel. Petra is an ancient Arab stronghold deep in the rugged mountains. It is accessible only by traveling through narrow, twisted gorges on horseback. Uh, next month he wrote, we thought of that when we were in Petra, and how undoubtedly this will be the very place we shall spend three and a half to seven, excuse me, three to seven years during the Great Tribulation, and possibly also the terrible day of the Lord soon to come. If we are close to God instead of this pleasure uh, mad world, if we are praying always and watching and, and accounted worthy to escape the things that are to come upon the earth, so Herbert Armstrong saying the words that Jesus said that I read from uh, Luke 21, you. If you, you pray to be counted worthy to escape, etc., perhaps you will go to a place such as Petra. Now, in 1968, he wrote, Apparently, many are carelessly supposing they are now sure of being protected through the Great Tribulation. Whether it will be Petra or another place, many carelessly feel carelessly secure. And after that, entering God's kingdom with eternal life. You don't have it made. This is what Herr Armstrong wrote. You are still being tried to determine whether you shall have this protection, whether you shall enter the kingdom of God. It is those who are led by the Spirit of God, not those who are led by desire for more and more physical material things. So hundreds of you are slacking off in your responsibilities in God's work. So hundreds of you are slacking off. So he's warning that people who claim to be Christian, people who were in the old at this point in time, the Worldwide Church of God, who should have been part of the Philadelphia era, said, no, a lot of you are slacking off. You think you're part of the work, but you're not. And don't think you've got it made, because you don't. Now, in 1982, he further wrote, I hope to arrange for us to use the use of Petra as a possible refuge or a place of safety during the Great Tribulation by C. King Hussein. Now, what he did then, I don't know. Um, and we will see if possibly uh, that will be the place. Now, after 
he wrote this. Apparently he felt many misconstrued his writings and it was almost time to go. But let me read this one verbatim. Incidentally, I know many of you seem to have your heart set on going very soon to Petra as a place of safety during the soon coming Great Tribulation. Well, get your minds off of Petra. Brethren, I've never said that Petra definitely is the place of protection where God will take us. I hope it is not. One reason it would be is the place no one else would want to go. It would be most unpleasant, uncomfortable, miserable place you could go. There's nothing to be desired there. But just in case, God has miraculously given me very gracious favor in the eyes of King Hussein and his brother, the crown prince. They're very friendly toward me personally. So we have the idea here that Herbert Armstrong said, look, it may not be there. Now why might, might we think it could be there? Well, let's go to the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 16, and I'm going to read a few verses. Because this is one of the places that gives a clue that it could be Petra. Send the lamb to the ruler of the land. From Selah to the wilderness. So Selah, uh, which literally means rock, but it's, I showed you again on that map, Selah, uh, Petra, to the wilderness, to the mount of the daughter of Zion. For it shall be as a wandering bird thrown out of the nest, so shall the daughters of Moab at the fords of Arnon. Verse 3, take counsel, execute judgment. Make your shadow like the night in the middle of the day. To do what? Hide the outcasts. Do not betray him who escapes. Aha. Remember Jesus talked about escaping? And you are kind of worthy to escaping? We read in Revelation chapter 12, 14 through 17, that you flee to the wilderness, it's a place of escape. So the people of Moab are told to hide the outcasts, those who escape. Verse 4, Let my outcasts dwell with you, O Moab, and be a shelter to them from the face of the spoiler. For the extortioner is at the end, devastation ceases, the oppressors are consumed out of the land. So we see here a reference to Moab. And let's go back. I'm going to find, try to find this again and show this map. And we see here uh, Moab. Now it runs next to, it, ne it runs next to uh, ancient Edom, but sometimes the Moabites went all the way down into this region. And because these lands right now are basically under control of one government, and that's uh, in Jordan, uh, a lot of the people there are Moabites. So it is possible that Selah, which is located, or Petra, which is located within Jordan, is a particular place that's being talked about. Now, there's a possibility that there are other places that are near Petra that could be the place. So, because I read, I read it, Isaiah 16, uh, 1 through 4, it said, from uh, Selah to the wilderness. So there's a lot of places in this area that it, that it could be. But let me go to the book of uh, Jeremiah, and let's read the uh, New King James Version. Jeremiah chapter 48. We're getting a few more clues from Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 48. In verse uh, 28, it says, You who dwell in Moab, leave the cities and dwell in the rock, and be like the dove which makes her nest in the side of her mouth. Now I kind of wonder, there's a town right side, just outside of Petra where there's like a small city and there are maybe hotels. Maybe people for a while will be there. But at some point in time, if that's the case, people are being told to leave there. And so I found that uh, uh, interesting, and so that's something else that might happen. Now there's another place that suggests a possible Jordanian location. And this is also in Jeremiah, so if you go up a few more chapters, this would be Jeremiah chapter 12. Because this is something that I think is very interesting and possibly applicable here. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5 through 6. If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, how can you contend with horses? And if in the land of peace in which 
you trusted, they wearied you, then how will you do in the floodplain of Jordan? So the first part of this is saying, look, those of you who have been in, let's say, the Anglo lands or other places where the persecution's not been that tough, how are you going to be when things really get bad? Again, we see the floodplains of Jordan. Verse 6, For even your brothers, the house of your father, even those, even they have dwelt treacherously with you. Yes, they have called a multitude after you. Do not believe them, even though they speak smooth words to you. Now what could this possibly have to do with? It's possible that those who are in Jerusalem will flee to go into Jordan. And that's where, by the way, you could run into the floodplain of Jordan. It's also possible that people will betray the Christians, the, the true Christians. Uh, if you'll notice, again, uh, Jeremiah is saying that even some of your own household will deal treacherously with you and they'll call a multitude after you. Well, you recall that in Revelation chapter 12, verses 14 through uh, 16, that Satan was enraged with the woman put a flood of some kind against the woman. We don't know if it's a literal flood, which would be interesting in the floodplain of Jordan, or if it's nations or people who are going to go after them. And so this seems to be consistent with this time of fleeing. But of course, this is also probably around the time, if, if not before then, that Michael the Archangel uh, will stand up. But it is definitely the time when the earth will help the woman, and so the woman will get to the place of protection. Now, I'd like to go back to the book of Zephaniah. I read a fair amount of passages in Zephaniah chapter 2, and I want to go back to it again. Let's see, okay, Zeph Zephaniah chapter 2. This time, I want to start in verse 8. I've heard the reproach of Moab and the insults of the people of Ammon, which they have reproached my people. So just because Christians may be protected in uh, Jordan, they still might have to deal with some negative things for the people there. And they've made arrogant threats against their borders. Verse 9, Therefore, as I live, says the Eternal, the God of hosts, surely Moab shall be like Sodom, and the people of Ammon like Gomorrah, overrun with weeds and uh, salt pits. And the perpetual desolation, the residue of my people shall plunder them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. This they shall have for their pride because they have reproached and made arrogant threats against the people of the eternal of hosts. So again, that's another reason to believe that a, a, a Jordanian location could possibly be the place of safety. And again, that the people, uh, some of the people on the countryside may not always be nice to God's people. Uh, let's read one other portion that ties along with this. This is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 26. In Isaiah 26, we also see this idea that God's people are protected, but there will be some people who uh, won't be super nice to them. Isaiah 26, starting verse 20. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. Verse 21. Behold, the Eternal comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no longer cover her slain. So we see again a time that the, uh, the people are supposed to be protected and God is going to put out punishment. Now, it's also possible that there could be a city near the location. If you go to Isaiah, not Isaiah, Psalm 107, verses 2 through 7, it says, Let the redeemed of the eternal say so, whom has redeemed from the hand of the, heaven, of the enemy, verse 3, and gathered out of the lands from the east and the west, the north and the south, and wandered in the wilderness to, in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in, so first they were out in the wilderness. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted them. They cried out the Eternal for their help. He delivered them out of their distress. He led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. So again, it's possible that for a short time, people may be in a city location. But as I read another passage earlier, 
that that's not going to always be the case. Christians who are going to go to this place of protection should not count on luxury. Um, we're probably going to go from being some of the most spoiled people in the history of humankind to very, very harsh environments. And that, but again, but God still promises to protect his people. Now, one of the reasons I think that uh, uh, people will uh, have problems and they may move around is because the Bible warns about great earthquakes in Revelation 16, etc. So that might be uh, just before then it would be time to leave the city or vice versa. But God is going to protect his people somewhere. Now, what are God's people going to be doing in the place of protection? Let's go to Isaiah 66. It's the last book of Isaiah. Excuse me, last chapter in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 66. Verse 19. I will set a sign among them and among those who escape. Ah, we're talking about people who escape. These could be true Christians. I will send to the nations to Tarshish, Pul, Lud, and those who draw the bow to Tubal and Jabin and to the coastal lands afar off who have not heard my fame nor seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Huh? This suggests that after the place escape, after Jesus returns, there are going to be Gentile peoples all over. The people who escaped are going to teach the word of God to these people. And that's one of the reasons why I suspect that during the time of protection, the place of safety, that God's people are going to be taught more about the word of God to support the work of God, to support the work of the two witnesses, but also, also, to pre be prepared to do the work of God after Jesus returns. And that's possibly why the Philadelphians are the ones who are protected. The Philadelphians are the ones who put their heart into doing the work of God now. So God will use them in a greater capacity uh, later. Now, I should also comment, a lot of people think that they're going to get there because of some minister or some relative of theirs or something along that line. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 14, and read something about that. Even, okay, we're going to start in verse 13. Son of man, when the land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I'll stretch my hand against it, I'll cut off its supply of bread, send famine on it, and cut off man and beast from it. So this could be the time of the Great Tribulation. Verse 14. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the eternal God. Only themselves. Verse 16. Even though these three men were in it, as I live, says the eternal God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, only they would be delivered and the land should be desolate. Okay, so God's warning people, look, don't believe that you will have to be protected if your father, mother, son, daughter, whatever, is a, is a strong Christian. And that's the warning. And that's another warning to Christians not to fall from the truth and to hold fast and to go ahead and, and, and do the work. Now, what about other Church of God groups? Um... I won't go through specific corporations right now, but I'm going to read a few passages what Jesus inspired the Apostle John to write about what happens to the other churches other than the, uh, the Philadelphians at the time of the end. The Thyatira, this is uh, Revelation 12, excuse me, 2, 18 to 23, 23. Thyatira. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. Sardis, Revelation 3, 1 and 3. Sardis, therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. And I'll just comment that the group that Herbert Armstrong claimed was the Sardis Church now discounts prophecy so much that it would be virtually impossible for people to actually believe their prophetic understanding to possibly be prepared to go to the place of safety. And the Laodiceans, Revelation 13, 14 through 19, 
Laodiceans, as many as I love, I rebuke and chase, and therefore be zealous and repent. But there's a difference between them and the Philadelphians. And I read this before. Revelation uh, 3, 7 says the Philadelphians. And verse 10 says, Because you've kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, while it's possible, some of the Thyatira, Sardis, and Laodicean churches will repent. Only the Philadelphians are promised this type of protection. Now, according to Herbert Armstrong, who's going to go to this place? This is from uh, United States and Britain, Commonwealth and Prophecy, 1975, page 60. Those in the true body of Christ shall be protected until this tribulation will be over, Revelation 3, 10, 11. Applying to those faithful in God's work now going to the world, Revelation 12, 14. But you must make your own decision. And to neglect this, to neglect, to neglect doing so, is the wrong decision. God isn't kidding. This is real. Decision is now yours. So basically, Robert Armstrong is warning people, you've got to do what God wants you to do. And Jesus warned the Laodiceans, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He also said that to the other churches, including the Philadelphians. We need to heed to make sure we can make it. Now, back in 1959, Herbert Armstrong's church wrote, God will set before us an open door that no man can shut. God can shut it. And he will, when the work is finished and the Philadelphia church has gone to the place of safety. Since Herbert Armstrong has been dead for decades, he was not teaching that when he died, the work was not supposed to be done. Philadelphia has a little strength to do this great work which God has given it to do. And that's what we're trying to do in the continuing church of God. It's the church of Laodicea who has no vital part in the work of God today, even though they live today and are part of the generation, will see Christ return. I believe that the Bible clearly teaches that the remnant of the Philadelphia church will go to the place of safety. And I do believe at this time that the direction to do so will come from the continuing church of God. Now my position is that Petra may be the place of safety. Uh, the reason it may not be is that's a very popular tourist place for the country of Jordan. Maybe a deal will be made that people will be near it for a while. And maybe we'll go to it. But if it's not the place, the Bible doesn't have a specific location that I've been able to find. But, the, but a place such as Petra in Jordan fits the criteria. But more importantly, let's go to uh, Luke chapter 21. This will be the last scripture. And I'd like to read this again. Uh, verse 36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Only those who are praying, only those who are truly supporting the Philadelphia work of the Church of God, and those who are truly Philadelphians will be protected in that place. We all need to... Pray, grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as it says in 2 Peter 3.18. Why? So we may be accounted worthy to be there.